on October 3, 1993, attack helicopters dropped about 120 elite American soldiers into a busy neighborhood in the heart of Mogadishu, Somalia. Their mission was to abduct several top lieutenants of Somalian warlord Mohamed Farah Adid and return to base. They estimated it would take 30 minutes to 45 minutes to conduct the raid, but things did not go well. Instead, two of their high-tech UH-80 Black Hawk attack helicopters were shot down. The men were pinned down through a long and terrible night in a hostile city, fighting for their lives. When they emerged the following morning, 18 Americans were dead and 73 were wounded. Hundreds, perhaps thousands, of Somalis were killed. Photos taken by Canadian photographer Paul Watson of a dead American soldier being dragged through the streets of Mogadishu spelled the beginning of the end for US-UN peacekeeping forces. Domestic opinion turned hostile as horrified TV viewers watched images of the bloodshed, including this Pulitzer Prize winning footage of Somali warlord Mohamed Adid's supporters dragging the body of US Staff Sergeant William David Cleveland through the streets of Mogadishu, cheering. Witnesses said a frenzied crowd seized the bodies, dragged them through the streets, and set them on fire. Some residents said that when gasoline was poured over the bodies and matches struck, a few of the soldiers were still alive. The public outrage that followed publication forced the Americans to end the war. The situation began in 1992 under the Bush administration. Violence in Somalia was on the rise throughout the 1980s and 90s, which allowed various regional warlords to come to power, and in turn, these forces went to war with one another. The images and reports of starving citizens spurred the world to action by delivering large supplies of food to the weary. However, warlords and their payroll cronies claimed the food from delivery vehicles before they ended up in the hands of the needy. This resulted in President George H.W. Bush committing American troops to the region to both counter the reach of the warlords and to ensure that Somali citizens could be fed. The 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake that hit off the west coast of Sumatra, Indonesia, triggered one of the most devastating tsunamis in history. The tsunami caused over 230,000 deaths in 14 countries. Hardest hit were Indonesia, followed by Sri Lanka, India, and Thailand. More than half of the deaths occurred in Indonesia. The earthquake measured between 9.1 and 9.3. It was the third largest earthquake ever recorded. This picture is one of the most representative and striking photos of the aftermath of the Indian Ocean tsunami and was taken by Reuters photographer Arko Dada while on assignment in Tamil Nadu, India. The photo depicts a grieving woman with arms and hands outstretched, mourning the death of a loved one. It doesn't show the devastation of the tsunami, however it does reflect the loss of life and emotions caused by the aftermath of the tsunami. Arco Data would later win the World Press Photo Competition of 2004. The Armenian Genocide was a series of heinous and systematic eliminations of the minority Armenian population of the Ottoman Empire by the Turkish government. On April 24, 1915, the Armenian Genocide began. Armenians were turned out of their homes and sent on death marches through the Mesopotamian desert without food or water. Frequently, the marchers were stripped naked and forced to walk under the scorching sun until they dropped dead. Some Armenians were even crucified and burned alive. In 1922, when the genocide was over, 1.5 million Armenians were dead, with many more forcibly removed from the country. This photograph of a Turkish government official mocking malnourished kids with a piece of bread is an example of the atrocities suffered during this grim period in history. Since taking office on June 30, 2016, Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte has launched a war on drugs that has resulted in the deaths of more than 6,000 Filipinos. The Philippine National Police's own data indicates that police killed at least 2,250 suspected drug personalities from July 2016 to January 2017, with an additional 3,600 alleged drug users and dealers killed by unidentified gunmen. In his campaign, Duterte promised to cleanse the country of drug users and dealers by extrajudicial means. He also promised to reduce crimes and stop corruption. Duterte believed that Philippines had the highest abuse rate in East Asia for methamphetamines, locally known as Shabu. 
In a televised speech on August 7th, he warned drug peddlers, drug users, and drug lords to surrender themselves or face summary execution. Suspects die in encounters with police or are shot by motorcycle-riding vigilante gunmen. Their taped-up bodies are left with a cardboard confessional sign strapped around their necks, saying pusher or drug lord, or dumped under a bridge or neighboring town. These heart-wrenching photos taken by Rafi Lerma on July 23, 2016, went viral. In the picture, 26-year-old Jenilyn Olayris cradling the body of her 29-year-old husband, Michael Ciaran, after he was gunned down by vigilantes on a street in a rundown area of Manila's Pasay City. A cardboard sign next to his body carried the chilling message, I'm a pusher, don't do what I did. It's probably one of the best known images of World War II, the enduring photograph that captures the last seconds of Leonard Sifleet's life. The photograph came to light after U.S. troops discovered it on the body of a Japanese officer near Hollandia in 1944. Featured in various newspapers and in Life magazine, it was thought to depict Flight Lieutenant Bill Newton, who had been captured in Salamoa, Papua New Guinea, and was beheaded on March 29, 1943. The soldier, who would become known because of the circumstances of his death, was actually Leonard George Len Sifleet. Sifleet was promoted to sergeant on May 5, 1943, and he was assigned as a radio operator in his unit. Not long after his promotion, he was transferred to M Special Unit and was sent to Hollandia, Papua New Guinea, with his fellow soldiers. In mid-September 1943, while part of a team led by Sergeant Staverman, Sifleet was underway to Itape while traveling behind Japanese lines. At some point in October 1943, they were discovered by New Guinea natives and surrounded. The New Guinea natives turned them over to the Japanese troops. After the Japanese had interrogated them for two weeks, Sergeant Sifleet and his two Ambanese comrades, Private Patawal and Private Raharan, were beheaded on Itape Beach on the 24th of October, 1943. On the evening of the 16th of March, 1993, 16-year-old Shadane Aroni was spotted sneaking into the Canadian compound near Belatwain in south-central Somalia. The Canadian force stationed there, a reinforced battalion that was organized around the Canadian Airborne Regiment. It was in Belatwain as part of UNITAF, the unified task force sanctioned by the UN Security Council as a Chapter 7 mission to keep the peace of Somalia in order to allow food and other relief to be distributed. Shadane Aroni's apparent purpose in sneaking into the compound was to steal something to sell on the local black market. He was caught and incarcerated. By the next morning, he was dead, slowly and methodically beaten to death by two paratroopers. During the course of the night, about a dozen other paratroopers became aware of the beating, but no one intervened. The widely circulated images of soldiers smiling and posing alongside his bloodied body and the attempted cover-up proved a transformative event in the course of Canadian military history. In the following months, one company commander was tried by a court-martial and convicted for encouraging the Rambo-like atmosphere that formed the context of the killing. The two killers were charged. One, Master Corporal Clayton Matchy tried to hang himself in 1993, but only succeeded in doing himself irreparable brain damage. And Private Kyle Brown was imprisoned for five years. Members of the Sigma Pi fraternity at Hofstra University took hazing to new heights, with never-before-seen pictures depicting a slew of stomach-churning rituals, including vomiting on one another and being covered from head to toe in hot sauce. The images, published by the Hofstra Chronicle, show students being subjected to a wide range of abuse over the course of the Fall of 2014 and Fall of 2015 pledge processes. They were obtained during a semester-long investigation in which numerous acts of extreme hazing were uncovered within the now-defunct fraternity, such as forced favors, a merit and demerit system, and anti-Semitic imagery. In one photo, three pledges from the fall class of 2015 can be seen sprawled out on the ground with their bodies covered in flour. Another shows a student locked in a small cage. 
Syed Ali John Meda, a former student and member of Sigma Pi's Beta Alpha class of spring 2015, told the Chronicle that the student chosen to sit in the cage is ultimately forced to remain inside for indefinite periods of time, which are then made longer if they are unable to answer a question about the fraternity or its members. A third photo shows a young man on his knees in front of a duct tape swastika, blindfolded and completely covered in ghost pepper hot sauce. According to Mehdi, the hot sauce stunt was the most painful hazing ritual that pledges had to endure, and it included covering their genitals. On the night of December 2, 1984, an accident at the Union Carbide Pesticide Plant in Bhopal, India, released at least 30 tons of a highly toxic gas called methyl isocyanate, as well as a number of other poisonous gases. The pesticide plant was surrounded by shanty towns, leading to more than 600,000 people being exposed to the deadly gas cloud that night. The gases stayed low to the ground, causing victims' throats and eyes to burn, inducing nausea and many deaths. Estimates of the death toll vary from as few as 3,800 to as many as 16,000, but government figures now refer to an estimate of 15,000 killed over the years. This heartbreaking photograph taken by an acclaimed Indian photojournalist named Pablo Bartholomew shows a baby being buried by his father. This scene was photographed by both Pablo Bartholomew and Raghu Ray, another renowned Indian photojournalist. This picture was taken by Frank Fournier in Colombia on Saturday, the 16th of November, 1985, a few days after the eruption of the Nevado del Ruiz volcano. The landslide provoked by the eruption had already killed 24,000 people, as the local authorities had taken no preventative measures despite the warnings of volcanologists. In this natural catastrophe, 13-year-old girl Amira Sanchez was caught in the town of Armero in debris transported by the mud. When her house got destroyed, her father and aunt died inside. She was able to survive, but when rescue teams tried to help her, they realized that her legs were trapped under the house's roof. Once the girl was freed from the waist up, her rescuers attempted to pull her out, but found the task impossible without breaking her legs in the process. Rescue workers placed a tire around her body to avoid her to drown. Divers discovered that Sanchez's legs were caught under a door made of bricks, with her aunt's body under her feet. Near the end of her life, Sanchez's eyes reddened, her face swelled, and her hands whitened. Hours later, the workers returned with a pump and tried to save her, but it still was impossible to free her without severing her legs. Lacking the surgical equipment to save her from the effects of an amputation, rescue teams could not save her life. In all, Sanchez suffered for three nights, 60 hours, before she died, most likely from gangrene or hypothermia. Fournier himself won the World Press Photo Prize in 1986 for this portrait, which reflected his own feeling of powerlessness. Omira's agonizing demise, surrounded by journalists and photographers, was followed live on television all over the world. This photograph was taken on February 28, 2002 in Ahmedabad, Gujarat, as deadly communal riots started spreading across the state the day after a train carrying Hindu pilgrims was torched in Godra. The weeks of violence that followed left over 1,000 people dead, most of them Muslim. The picture, taken by photojournalist Arko Dada, has since become the defining image of the Gujarat riots, embodying the horror of one of the worst episodes of communal violence in India's history. The man in the picture is Kutubuddin Ansari, who became the face of the riots. It shows Ansari, then a 29-year-old tailor, looking out from the first floor of a building as an angry mob approached. The ground floor of the house was already completely ablaze. 